All right, here we go. We're going to hop into chapter 8. Chapter 8, here we go. Wednesday, May 29th, Thursday, June 6th, 1776. We have in common with all other men a natural right to our freedom without being deprived of them by our fellow men. We were unjustly dragged by the cruel hand of power from our dearest friends and some of us stolen and brought hither to be made slaves for life in a Christian land. Thus are we deprived of everything that hath a tendency to make life even tolerable. This is a, from a petition for freedom from a group of slaves to Massachusetts Governor Thomas Gage, His Majesty's Council and the House of Representatives, um, 25th May 1774. So um, people are going to be trying to use the legal ways to get, gain their freedom. And we're going to see in different cases, some people will be successful and other people will not. So um, these freedom fighters never gave up. They tried in many, many different ways to get their, their natural rights. Here we go. The day started early in the locked-in kitchen. Since Becky lived in a boarding house on Oliver Street, it fell to me to wake first and build up the fire. She did the proper cooking, and I did near everything else, like washing pots and plates and beating eggs, till my arms fell off from Adam's almond jumbles and plum cakes with icing. If not in the kitchen, I was removing colonies of spiders, polishing tables and chairs, or sweeping up a mountain of dust. I saved the cobwebs, twisting them around a rag and storing them by our pallet in the cellar. Cobwebs were handy when a person had a bloody cut. Madam complained every time she saw me. I left a streak of wax on the table top. I tracked in mud. I faced a china dog towards the door after I dusted it, which would cause the family's luck to run out. At the end of every scolding, I cast down my eyes and said, yes, madam. I kept careful track of her the same way I was used to mind the neighbor's bull when I took the milk to cows out in the pasture. She had not hit me again, but always seemed on the edge of it. Mostly madam slept late, wrote letters, and picked out melodies on a body tuned spinet. A few times she and her husband conversated fast and quiet about Mr. Washington and when the king ships would arrive for the invasion. They argued fiercely on Thursday night. Lockton shouted and called Madam rude names before storming out of the house, the front door crashing behind him. I vowed not to cross neither of them. Madam went to bed early that night, so we did too. Ruth snuggled next to me and fell quick asleep, or fell asleep quick. I lay awake, praying hard but gaining little comfort. I was lost. I knew that we were in the cellar of a house on Wall Street owned by the Locktons in the city of New York, but it was like looking into a knot, knowing it was a knot, but not knowing how to untie it. I had no map for this life. I lay awake and stared into the darkness. Madam called for tea in her bedchamber the next morning and sent Ruth, who was pumping the butter churn with vigor. Why would she need Ruth? I asked as I wiped my sister's hands and face with a damp rag. Why does she do anything, Becky asked. I'm to climb to the attic to fetch the cast-off clothing in an old trunk. Maybe she'll set the little one to rip out the stitches so the dressmaker can use the fabric. This best be the last of this day's fanciful notions. My knees don't like all this upping and downing of the stairs. Ruth stayed in Madam's chamber for hours. I spilled the fireplace ashes on the kitchen floor, then kicked over the bucket of wash water I brought in to clean up the mess. I stubbed my toe and near cut off my finger whilst peeling an old, tough turnip. When I could stand it no more, I snuck out of the kitchen and tiptoed down the hall. I could hear the sound of Madame's voice from the bottom of the stairs, but not the words she was saying. I wanted to march up there and tell Ruth to come back and finish the butter. I did not. I forced myself to work. Becky took a tray of cookies and a spot of tea upstairs late in the afternoon. I pounced when she returned to the kitchen. Is Ruth well? Why does Madame keep her? Becky chose her words with care. Madam has taken a liking to your Ruth on account of her being so tiny and quiet. She sat at the kitchen table. She means to use her for a personal maid. Pardon me? Most of Madam's friends have a slave to split wood and carry chamber pots like you. If Madam has a slave dressed in finery, well, that makes her more of a lady. Ruth can fan her when she's hot or stir the fire when she's cold. I forgot myself and sat down across from Becky. She's making Ruth into a curiosity? Becky nodded. Aye, that's a good word for it. I went cold with anger, then hot, then cold. It wasn't right. It wasn't right for one body to own another or pull strings to make them jump. Why was Madam allowed to hit me or treat Ruth like a toy? Take care, Becky warned, pointing to my lap. I looked down. My hands were clenched into fists so tight the cords that held my bones together could be seen. 
I released them. Becky leaned across the table and spoke quiet. I don't imagine you like this much. Can't say I blame you, but don't lose your head. Madam is not afraid to beat her slaves. I rubbed my palms together. Do they own more than us? Half a dozen down to the Charleston place, none up in Boston. Never been to the Carolinas, so I don't know how they get along, but you need to calm yourself and heed what I'm telling you. Yes, ma'am, I said stiffly. Two, three years ago, there was another girl here, a slave like you. She talked back. Madam called her surly and took to beating her regular leg. One day she beat her with a fireplace poker. Did she die? No, but her arm broke and didn't heal right. It withered and hung useless, so Madam sold her. I could not hold the hot words in my mouth any longer. She best not come after me with a poker or hurt Ruth. Becky leaned back and studied me a bit. You ain't never going to say something like that again, not in my kitchen. I get paid decent here, and I won't let some girl like you get in the way of that. Wearing pretty dresses ain't going to hurt that little one, so wipe that look off your face and fetch more wood. After that, Ruth's every waking moment was spent with Madam. Though we worked in the same house and slept under the same blanket, we had little time to talk. Ruth was permitted to sleep until the sun rose, went to bed when Madam retired, and rarely had to work in the kitchen or garden. I lay awake every night, heart filled with dread, recalling the dangerous offer made by the boy in the floppy red hat. Chapter 9 Thursday, June 6, 1776 Hundreds in this New York colony are active against us, and such is the weakness of the government, if it can deserve the name, that the Tories openly profess their sentiments in favor of the enemy and live unpunished. Letter of William Tudor. He was Washington's chief legal officer to John Adams. So people are showing which sides they're on, but they don't have enough, um, I guess, power or ability to punish them if they're supporting the wrong side. So very, very dangerous. It's hard to hold a city, and it's hard to do so with, with um, without the funding or all of the trained soldiers to do that. I was stuck on the back steps with a pile of dull knives and a wet stone. It was a dreary job. First spit on the stone, next hold the knife at the proper angle and circle it against the stone. Ten to the left, ten to the right, until the blade was sharp enough to slice through the joint of beef like it was warm butter. As I sharpened, I imagined using the knife to cut through the ropes that tied us to New York. I'd slice through the ocean, and Ruth and me would walk on the sand all the way home, ten circles to the left. Ruth was above stairs, standing by, whilst Madame prepared herself for company. The master was locked in his library. Becky was somewhere in the crowd watching. General Washington prayed down Broadway with five regiments of soldiers. The sounds of beating drums and whistling fifes, and the cries of, Huzzah! Huzzah! blew towards me over the rooftops. I pushed everything out of my mind, save my task, ten circles to the right. Becky came back from the parade an hour later, overflowing with stories. She nattered on about a spectacle whilst assembling the tea things for Madame and Lady Seymour, who had come to call again. I pretended to listen. Truth be told, I didn't notice when she left carrying the tray. Ten circles to the left, ten circles to the righty, all the blade sharp and mighty. Ten circles to the left, ten to the right. Becky, was, Becky called for me twice before I heard her proper. Her voice was high and tight. I said to hurry. You want to get me put on the streets? Madam wants you in the parlor. The knife near slipped from my hands. Is it Ruth? No, the Lady Seymour wants to see you, and the master just arrived with gentlemen friends all calling for food and drink. Hurry! I washed up in the cold water bucket, quickly pinned on a clean apron, checked my kerchief was on proper, and followed Becky to the parlor. She rapped lightly on the door and pushed it open. The new girl, ma'am, she said, setting a plate of fresh baked strawberry tarts on the table. Show her in, Madam said. Becky waved at me to enter. Madam and an older woman sat at the table, but my eyes were drawn behind them to my sister, dressed up as Madam's pretty pet in a bleached linen shift, a navy blue brocade, short gown, and a full skirt patterned with lilacs. When she saw me, she clenched her hands tight together and, a bit of her and bit her lower lip. Her eyes were red and swollen from crying. My belly went full and my mind raced. Why had she been crying? Was she sick, scared? Did Madam hurt her? Becky poked me gently in the back. This was not the time for questions. I quickly dropped to a curtsy, bowing my head. When I stood up, the older woman, the lady aunt with all the money, gave me a shadow of a smile. She was smaller than Madam and wore a silk gown the color of a morning dove and gray lace gloves. Her hair was curled high and powdered snow white. 
The necklace set in with black stones shone from her neck. There were deep lines at the corner of her eyes and around her mouth, but I couldn't tell if they were from laughing or crying. She turned in her chair and looked at Ruth, and then back at me. And these two girls are the sisters, she asked? Madam reached for a tart. That's what the man said. The older woman sipped her tea. What's your name, girl? She asked me. Isabel, ma'am, I said. Isabel Finch. Ridiculous name, madam said. She opened her fan and waved it in front of her face. You are called Sal Lockton now. It's more suitable. I forced myself to breathe in slow and regular instead of telling her that my, my name was not her affair. Yes, ma'am. She glanced at my feet. And must you wear your shoes? This is a house, not a barn. Ruth stepped out of her corner. Isabel. Madam snapped the fan shut and wrapped it against the edge of the table, startling us all. What did I tell you about silence, she said roughly. Ruth raised one shaking finger to her mouth and said, Shh. Precisely, madam, set the fan in her lap and reached for a piece of sugar with silver tongs. When she plopped it in the cup, the tea overflowed into the saucer. Ruth stood there like a carved statue, her finger still held to her lips. I took another breath, slower than the first, and tried not to think on the newly sharpened knives on the kitchen steps. Lady Seymour curled her finger around the teacup, her gaze marking first Madam, then Ruth, then me. She said nothing. Would you like Sal to serve you and Lady Seymour while I wait on the gentleman? Becky asked. Absolutely not. Show her the library and make sure the men are fed, and bring fresh tea. This has already gone cold. We curtsied and left the parlor. Ruth's sad eyes followed me to the door. Ten circles to the left, ten circles to the righty, all make the blade sharp and mighty. Back in the kitchen, Becky took a large silver tray off a high shelf in the pantry. Hold this. She loaded the tray with plates of cold sliced tongue, cheddar cheese, brown bread, a bowl of pickles. I could not stop thinking about the way Ruth had jumped when Madame shouted, nor the tears in her eyes. Becky took down a second tray and set upon it four goblets, two bottles of claret wine, and a crock of mustard. She swung the kettle back over the fire to heat up more water, picked up the tray of the wine, and said, Hop to. I followed her to the front of the house. But what about my shoes? The master won't note as long as he gets his grub. Becky balanced the edge of the tray on her hip and knocked on the door on the right side of the front hall. With a deep voice, when a deep voice answered, she opened it. Lockton looked up as we entered. Oh, good, sustenance, he said, pushing aside a stack of newspapers to clear off the desk. The room was the same size and shape as the parlor, but two of the walls had bookcases built into them. A large painting of horses jumping over a high hedge hung on the third wall, a thin layer of dust over everything. The front windows were open, bringing in fresh air and noise from the streets. Carts rolling over cobblestones and church bells in the distance mingled with the voices of the four men who sat around the enormous desk. One man looked poorer than the others. The cuffs of his coat were frayed, and his hands were stained with ink. Next to him sat a man with suspicious gray eyes and a liver-colored coat with a double row of gold buttons fastened over a large pudding belly. The third man wore something on his head that looked more like a dead possum than a wig, but his coat was crisp and new and the buckles on his shoes gleamed. The fourth was Master Lockton, looking like a cat who had just swallowed the last bite of a juicy mouse. Becky set her tray on the sideboard. I held mine as she poured the wine and served the gentleman. Then she had me hold the food tray so that she could serve the tongue and cheese. Talk halted as the men started in on their meal. Becky, Madam called from across the hall. Go see to her, Lockton told Becky. The girl can stay here. Does she know where the wine is? Yes, sir, I said. Becky and Lockton both stared at me. I had spoken out of turn. My job was to be silent and follow orders. Ruth had already learned that. Shh. Keep the wine flowing and the plates full, Lockton said. My friends eat more at my table than at their own. As Becky left, Gold Buttons drained his wine, then raised his goblet. I hurried to pour him in another, and topped off the drink with the other men. Lockton gave me a curt nod when I was finished. Stand over there, he said, pointing to the corner where the two bookshelves met each other. I gave a wordless curtsy and took my place. The men dove back into their conversation. Who has been arrested because of the oath, demanded Lockton. Fools, unschooled in the art of fence-sitting, said Gold Buttons. Plank walking, you mean, said Inkstained. Shabbywig leaned forward and pointed his finger at Inkstained. Don't you turn the coward on us, not when we're this close. Close? argued Inkstained. Do you see His Majesty's ships in the harbor? I don't. I might argue that England has fled and rebel traitors have won. Lower your voices, Lockton said with a scowl. 
He closed the windows with a loud bang and returned to his seat. His Majesty's ships are very close, closer than you know. This rebellion will be smashed like a glass under a heavy boot, and the king will be very grateful for our assistance. The mention of the king caught my ears. I studied the wide boards on the floor and listened with care. Gold Buttons popped a piece of cheese into his mouth and talked as he chewed. I sincerely hope you speak the truth, Elihu. These rebel committees are multiplying faster than rabbits in the spring. They've just about ground business to a halt. Have they interfered with you directly, Lockton asked. Every waking moment, Gold Button said. The latest bit of nonsense is a committee to detect conspiracies. They've sent the hounds on us, old friend. Have you written to Parliament? They need the specifics of our difficulties. Parliament is, Parliament is as far away as the moon, complained Inkstain. As the other men argued about Parliament and letters of protest and counter-letters and counter-counter-letters, Shabbywig stabbed at the last piece of tongue on his plate and shoved them into his mouth. He turned in his seat to look at me, held up his plate, and grunted. If I had ever done such a thing, Mama would have switched my behind for having manners of a pig. Even Miss Mary Finch had asked with a please and thank you when Mama served her dinner. This is New York, I reminded myself as I crossed the room and took the plate from his hand. The rules are different. I loaded his plate down with the last slices of tongue and set it in front of him before returning to my corner. Everything is different. My belly growled and grumbled in its cage. The smell of the tongue and mustard and cheese filled the room and made my mouth water. I had eaten a bowl of corn mush at sunrise and only dumplings at midday to distract the beast in my gullet. I tried to read the names on the books of the shelves without turning my head. My eyes were as starved for words as the rest of me for dinner. It was hard to read from, that, from the side like that. I wanted to pull down a book, open it proper, and gobble up page after page. I wanted to stare into the faces of those men and demand they take me home. I wanted to jump on a horse in the painting and fly over the hills. Most of all, I wanted to grab my sister by the hand and run as fast as we could until the cobblestones disappeared and there was dirt under our feet again. Girl, Lockton said, bring us more bread, slice thin, and some of Becky's apricot jam. I miss the taste of that. I curtsied and hurried out of the room, leaving the door open a crack so I could easily open it when I came back with my hands full. Across the hall came the quiet conversation of Madame and Lady Seymour. I paused but heard no mention of Ruth. There was fresh bread on the kitchen table, but it took a piece of time to find the crock of jam. I used one of my sharp knives to slice the loaf, set out the slices on a clean plate, and put the plate of jam on a tray. It was taking me too long to finish this simple chore. I feared the master would be angry with me, and I was angry with myself for being afraid. I was just about to push open the library door with my foot when the master said, Compliments of His Majesty, gentlemen. There's enough money here to bribe half of the rebel army. I stopped and peered through the crack. Madame's linen chest, the one that she had fussed about when we arrived, was in the middle of the library floor, the top thrown open. Underskirts and shifts were heaped on the floor beside it. Lockton reached into the chest and pulled out two handfuls of paper currency. Huzzah! said Inkstain in gold buttons, and they let out a low whistle. So she had a whole bunch of money from the king in there, and it was all planned. But remember how that whole scene where she was saying, are you going to look through a lady's underwear? Um, so again, just like we learned last week, women are going to be able to get away with some things um, because people are not going to take them seriously. They're going to really think that she was concerned about her underwear being seen by people versus that she actually had money hidden in there. Do you have a man ready, Lockton asked. Two, Shabby Wig answered. One will operate out of Corby's Tavern and the other from Highlander. Good, Lockton crossed back to his desk. I could no longer see him, but his words were clear. Every man willing to switch sides is to be paid five guineas and 200 acres of land. If he have a wife, an additional 100 acres. Each child of his blood garners another 50. Makes me want to marry the next lady I clap eyes on, Gold Button said. Lockton chuckled. I gave the door a little push and swung it open. Sir, I asked in a hushed tone. Enter, Lockton said. I walked in. The other men did not look my way. I was invisible to them until they needed something. Jam, he said with a smile. Put it here. I placed the tray in front of him and took my place again in the corner. The men spread the jam on the bread and drank their wine, discussing politics and war and armies over the stacks of money on my master's desk. The smell of apricots filled the warm room. It put me in a mind of of the orchards down the road from Miss Mary's place. I kept my face still as a plaster mask, but inside my brain pan, thoughts chased round and round. 
By the time the men rose to leave, I knew what I had to do. So what do you think she has to do? What's, what's your prediction about her? All right, chapter 10. Thursday, June 6th, 1776. The people of New York, why the people are magnificent in their carriages, which are numerous, in their house furniture, which is fine, in their pride and conceit, which are inimitable, in their profaneness, which is intolerable, in the want of principle, which is prevalent, and in their Tory Toryism, which is insufferable. A letter from the Patriot Colonel Henry Knox to his wife, Lucy. So he's gonna hate it there. He feels like people are using bad language, that they have no morals, they like really rich, wealthy things, um, and that they're supporting the wrong side. Lady Seymour was the first to leave, followed soon after by the gentleman in the library. Lockton and Madame retired upstairs, releasing Ruth for the evening and leaving me with the clean-up. For supper, we ate the remainders from the plate of ink stained and gold buttons, cold tongue, and brown bread. Ruth ate three bites and laid her head down on the table. When Becky left for the night, I held my sister's hand and walked her down the steep steps. Our bed was a thin mattress stuffed with old corn husks in front of the potato bin. I helped her out of her skirt and removed my own. Just before I blew out the candle, I asked, Why were you crying in the parlor today? before Becky and me came in. Did Madam hurt you? Her eyes puddled with tears and she shook her head from the side. No foolin'. Did you play or fuss? Was Madam angry with you? Did she hit you? She sniffed and wiped her nose on the sleeves of her shift. Shh, she said again. That wretched woman beat Ruth. I just knew it. She would beat Ruth into total silence if I let her. I kissed her tears and we knelt to pray. When we finally laid down, my fingers felt along the edge of my blanket looking for the rip that Mama had sewed up with tiny feather stitches. She wouldn't let anyone hurt her children. Where's my baby, Ruth muttered, half asleep. She asked every night. The bad man stole your doll, baby, I reminded her. The skinny one who stole us. He took everything. Everything? I tugged her close. Almost everything. But I'll get it back. Don't worry. Just go to sleep. I can't sleep without my baby. There was a stubborn note in her voice. I'll make you another doll, I promise, but not tonight. Want me to sing to you? I didn't wait for the answer, but started in on an island lullaby that Mama had loved. Ruth lay quiet, her breath steady and slow. By the time the song was over, she was fast asleep. I waited a full hour until the clock struck eleven, then slipped out from under the blanket and put my skirt back on. I did not stuff my feet into my shoes. I'd be faster and quieter without them. I climbed up the cellar steps, freezing with every groan of old wood. If Madame or Lockton come across me, I'll say on my way to the privy. They couldn't be angry about that. A body must follow the call of nature, even in the dead of night. The kitchen was so dark I walked slowly, my hands feeling in front of me so I wouldn't bump into the table or knock over a pitcher on the sideboard. I paused at the back door. The sound of the Lockton snoring came from above, like faraway thunder. I'm on my way to the privy, I reminded myself. No harm in that. I carefully opened the door and stepped outside. The night air was crisp and smelled faintly of salt. I tiptoed down the back steps and flew past the privy and around the side of the house to the gate, which hid in shadows. My heart pounded so loud I felt sure it would wake up the entire street. I had only to open the gate latch and step out. My hand would not move. If I opened the gate, I would be a criminal. Slaves were not allowed after sun out after sunset without a pass from a master. Anyone who caught me could take me to jail. If I opened the gate, a judge could order me flogged. If I opened the gate, there was no telling what punishment Madam would demand. If I opened the gate, I might die of fright. I leaned my head against the gate. I could not open the gate, but I had to open the gate. This house was not a safe place. I had to get us out, but there was no way to get out. No way to run away off an island. No way to run with a little girl. The secret of Madam's linen chest was the only key I held. Watch over me, Mama. I opened the latch, slipped out the gate, and ran. I thought it would be easy. I would run straight to the shed behind Bellingham's house, tap on Kirsten's window, tell him the news, and hurry home. It was a nightmare after all, or it was a nighttime after all, and folks would be asleep. Not in New York. Not in a city occupied by the Continental Army. At the end of the block, there were soldiers on watch in front of City Hall, a dozen or so men standing around a campfire with more dozing on the ground. One man was trying to read a letter by the firelight. Another was roasting a small piece of meat at the end of a stick. Their guns were close at hand. 
I crept as close as I dared, but there was no way to sneak past them. I swallowed hard and turned around to head east, away from the firelight. The next corner was dark and lonesome. I turned south, then west again, and then was forced north for three blocks by loud soldiers spilling out of taverns. The crowded buildings confuddled me. I tried to be brave like Mama or Queen Esther in the Bible, but I just knew there were hobgoblins a walk in in the dark, looking to steal the breath from a girl's body. I hid when I heard voices, and when a horseman galloped down the middle of the street, the horse's hooves sparked off the cobblestones and sounded like a hammer striking a forge. I chased up and down the streets and alleys, sticking to the shadows and shying away from the flickering street lamps as I ran. Finally, the street emptied out onto a wharf. I had reached one of the two rivers that sheltered New York Island, but I couldn't tell if I was looking at the east or the north. I ventured out farther into the street. Relaxed men told loud jokes to each other on the waterfront. A tin whistle played. A small dog, yip, dog yipped. The masts of the ships grew thicker to my right. That was my heading. The shapes of the building and the outline of the wharves be soon became familiar. There was a dock to the heart's horn. The dock the heart's horn had tied to. Oh my gosh, my allergies. Oh, We've been having the windows open for fresh air, but oh, it's making my nose itch. The, that was There was the dock the heart's horn had tied to, and there was Bellingham's building. I snuck down the alley to the shed window that Kirsten described. This was the end of my quest. I took a deep breath and said a prayer and rapped on the glass. Nothing happened. I started to rap again, then stopped. What if this is the wrong window, the wrong house? What if the person within thinks me a thief in the night or a murderess? What if... Country? A puzzled voice called to me from the shadows of the back end of the tavern, a few buildings down. Every window in the tavern was lit up and the air loud with angry shouts of men and deep argument. Are you speaking to me, I said, trying to keep my voice from shaking. What are you doing here? Kirsten stepped out of the shadows and motioned for me to join him. I dashed towards him, keeping to the edge of the tavern candlelight. I have news of Lockton and more. I quickly told him everything I had seen and heard. Is the money still there? He finally asked. A portion, I said. The gentleman took some with them, but Lockton placed the rest back in the chest. Then I was sent to fetch more wine. The chest was gone on my return. He nodded gravely. Will this be enough to send us home, I asked. Can they get us on the ship tomorrow? I can have Ruth at the docks by sunup. He raised both his hands. Go home and sleep. I'll take your news to Master Bellingham. I expect the committee will visit Lockton tomorrow. Whatever you do, don't let on that you were the informant. Why not, I asked. How else can I claim what's mine? The colonel will know who you are and how to find you. Until you hear from him, you're just the new Lockton girl. But not for long, I said, trying to sound braver than I felt. Not for long, he agreed. Go home now. I hesitated. I don't know how. I got lost coming here. He chuckled softly. It's easy enough once you know the way. He gave me directions. Thank you, I said, picking up my skirts. Thank you for everything. Go quickly. When I was halfway up the alley, he called after me. Ho there, country. What? Well done. Oh, man. So do you guys think that it's going to... Um, immediately work out for her or do you think it's going to be a little more complicated hmm. we'll see all right um, chapter 11 Friday June 7th 1776 there's nothing more necessary than good intelligence to frustrate a designing enemy and nothing more requires greater plans to obtain letter of George Washington to Robert Morris so we learned this week about how George Washington is going to be the spy master the, the leader of the Culper spy ring, and he is going to need all the information he can get from sources like Isabel, and um, we're going to learn more about that. So here we go. It felt like Becky shook me awake the moment I fell asleep. Make haste, girl, she hissed. You didn't start the fire. Why are you still abed? Haste was the word of the day. No matter how hard I tried, I couldn't catch up. It did not help that Madam was in a mood. Girl, she said to me as I prepared to sweep the kitchen floor, the bedding needs to be aired. Yes, ma'am. I set the broom back in its place and went upstairs, where I stripped off the bedding, carried it outside, and pegged it to the line. Just as I finished, Madam opened the back door. Why are you dawdling so, she yelled. The floor in here is filthy, and the banister needs to be polished, and I told you to wear not to wear or and I told you to wear your shoes in my house. After I squeezed my feet into those small, dreadful shoes, it was back up to the sweeping and then the polishing of the banister with soft rags and beeswax scented with lemon. 
When I made my way halfway up the stairs, Madam yelled at me for airing the bed linen on a day that threatened to rain. At least she did not call for Ruth's company. Becky had set my sister to scrubbing the back steps. Ruth hummed so loudly it put me in a mind of a swarm of bees and clover. As I gathered the sheets, I watched the gate, watching and waiting for the rebels to arrive and arrest the Lochtons and reward me with our liberty. We would be given proper cabins on the ship. I was sure of it. No more riding in the hold with barrels of salt cod. Ruth and me would have a cabin fit for ladies with bunks and blankets and pillows and three meals every day. Yes, indeed, that was my future. Aren't you done yet? Becky yelled from the back door. We have to prepare the drawing room. I shook away my dreams. The drawing room on the second floor wasn't a room where folks sat with paints and colored chalk to draw pictures like I'd figured. It was another parlor, three times the size of the one downstairs. We removed the sheets covering the furniture. A dozen chairs with needlework seats were scattered around the room, organized around tables with delicate legs. A low settee stood in front of the fireplace, and a mirror framed in mahogany hung above the mantel, flanked by oil lamps fastened on the walls. Why this room has to be prepared is beyond me, Becky muttered as we folded the sheets together. No staff to speak of, the larder half empty, the city getting ready to explode, and she wants this turned out and polished. Of all the foolish... A loud beating on the front door interrupted her. Dash it all, Becky exclaimed as she clattered down the stairs. Keep folding, she called to me. Not for love or money, I peered out of the front window. The group of men clustered on the front steps did not look like angels, but they could have been in disguise. Four wore the coats, breeches, powdered wigs, and hats of merchants. One had papers tucked under his arm. Six soldiers stood behind them all, wearing uniforms but carrying long metal bars instead of guns. Becky opened the door and all the men filed inside. I stepped out into the hall and peered down the stairs. The man with the papers under his arm had removed his hat. It was Master Bellingham. My heart sang. The door slammed overhead as Madame flew out of her chamber. What is the meaning of this? I pressed myself against the wall so she could rush by me, then followed her down the stairs. The soldiers had split into two groups. Half went into the front parlor and the other half into Lockton's library. Both groups set to removing the windows, prying them out of their casings with the long bars. "'What are you doing to my windows?' Madame demanded. Bellingham approached her. "'No need to fret, ma'am. We're all called to make sacrifices.' "'Sacrifices?' Master Lockton asked as he hurried in. "'This is thievery. What right do you have to destroy my home?' There was a horrific crash in the parlor as the hooks that held up the heavy draperies flew off the wall and landed on the floor. Plaster dust swirled. Bellingham removed the papers under his arm. "'You surprise me, Elihu,' he said. "'I thought a patriot such as yourself would welcome a chance to contribute to the army.' Beads of sweat stood at the edge of Lockton's wig. "'How does that pertain to the ripping down of my house, James?' Bellingham patted Lockton's shoulders. "'We need your lead, friend, for ammunition. Good people throughout the city are donating all the lead they own. The Provincial Congress will compensate you, of course, in due time. I've invoices prepared.' Madam frowned. How is it possible to turn windows into bullets? The counterweights are made of lead, ma'am, Bellingham explained, and your drapery pulls. This is an outrage, Lockton fumed. No, Elihu, Bellingham said. This is war. Even our churches are making sacrifices, delivering their bells to be recast as cannons. Surely you do not rate your home above the houses of God. The soldiers left the library, deposited the lead weights by the front door, and headed up to the second floor knocking their shoulders against the paintings of the Lockton ancestors that lined the staircase. I wanted to shout that they should search for the money in the linen chest. Instead, I, shank, I shrank against the wall to let them pass. They hadn't restored the windows. They haven't restored the windows to the frames, protested Lockton. Where are they going, madam asked. There are plenty of carpenters who will assist with the windows if you don't feel up to the task yourself, Elihu, Bellingham said. Sir, shouted a soldier upstairs. We found it. Bellingham dropped his manners and bounded up the stairs, two at a time. Madame and Lockton followed to close, close on his heels. I, tr excuse me, I trailed behind. The bedchamber was a large room made small by four poster canopy bed that sat hi as high as a carriage, two massive armoires, and a half dozen men with red faces. Madame had once again set herself on her walnut linen chest, which was in front of the hearth. Why was it up here? Of all the insults, of all the assaults on the dignity of a woman, she said to Bellingham, this, sir, is the lowest, the most base. I shall see to it that every leader in every land knows. 
Madam, Bellingham said sternly, if you do not take your person from that chest, I shall order these soldiers to remove you. You would not dare, she said. Oh, yes, he would, dear, Lockton said. Please, wife, let these men do their work with no further delay. There is nothing to worry about. It seemed he seemed to have to hide a message beneath those words, for Madame relaxed some and stood with Grace. If you insist, husband, she said. Perhaps you would prefer to go below stairs, Lockton suggested. The girl can heat some wine to calm your nerves. Madame shook her head. No, dear, I shall remain by your side. Bellingham gave the sergeant a quick nod. The man knelt in front of the chest and opened the latch. Deliverance. They'll arrest them both and reward me mightily. We'll leave this horrid place by sunset. One corner of Lockton's mouth turned up in a sly smile as a blushing soldier removed the shifts and underskirts. My heart skipped a beat. Why were dirty linens still in there? Becky gathered all the washing yesterday. The soldier looked up at Bellingham. That's all, sir. Clean down to the bottom. I wanted to shout. The money is underneath the false bottom. But pressed my lips together. Bellingham knelt and checked for himself, knocking the wooden sides. Lockton's grin had spread to both sides of his mouth. Would you care to inspect all of our clothing, James? Perhaps you'd send a man to root through the potatoes and parsnips in the cellar. He had hidden the money elsewhere. That's why he was at ease. Bellingham rose to his feet and stood with his hands behind him. Would he turn on me, accuse me of making a false report to expose me to the Locktons? No. He searched through his papers until he pulled out one and he handed it to Lockton. You are summoned to the New York Provincial Congress for suspicion of aiding the enemy, Elihu, and placing you under arrest. The soldiers will escort you. He nodded his head. Two soldiers grabbed Lockton by his elbows. His smile vanished. Wait, Madam said. You can't arrest him. He's done nothing. To the contrary, ma'am, Bellingham snapped. He has put the lives of thousands in jeopardy. The men filed by me without another word. Bellingham kept his face straight ahead, but as he passed by, he cut his eyes on me. They drilled a hole right into my fear of discovery. There was the clatter of boots on the stair treads, then boots on the marble steps outside, and then the crash of the front door slamming. They were gone. Madam stared blankly at the empty doorway. Ma'am, I said quietly. Her eyes turned to me, then she blinked, as if suddenly realized who I was and where she stood. Don't you stand there, girl. These linens need to be washed. I can't think of how Becky missed them. I shall speak to her about laziness. And then she fainted. Woo! So, definitely not the way that Isabel had hoping it, it would go, but, um, man, Matt Bellingham, he is wily. And you have to be if you're going to be um, a spy in the American Revolution or sharing information. So, um... I'm going to pause here. My voice is getting a little sore, but I hope you guys enjoyed it. And um, we're just at the beginning. And then remember, this is a trilogy. So this, oh my gosh, this is one of my favorite stories. Um, I also read a book that I thought you guys would like. And uh, I'm not sure where I put it. But it is um, written by the same author as Blood on the River that we read this year, Eliza Carbone. And it's called Stealing Freedom. And it's um, set during the, a um, little bit later. So it's a different time period, but if you enjoy stories like this, you might like it. Um, and I'll, um, I'll show it to you guys in class this week. So, yay! I hope you guys liked it. I'll see you later!